another day, another show, um, another episode with Access to Perspectives Conversations. And I'm very glad to introduce to you all Anna Maria Bergholz. She's a PhD student in Germany, Cottbus to be precise. And yeah, welcome to the show. Thank you, Joel. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. Yeah. And we've been we've been chatting um in various well, we've attended a course I've I've given um for the university and the PhD students. And then um yeah, we we just discovered that we have a lot of shared interests. And I think it's also important for as as I was an international student also during my PhD, or actually I did my PhD in Germany, so it wasn't so international, but before I started my PhD, I traveled a lot and I was working at the Max Planck Institute where we had a lot of internationals. Um, and yeah, so I, I was basically let's say exposed or I, I witnessed basically the difficulties. Um, and as much as it's fun and and exciting to get to know another country and all of that but it's also hard work to settle in another country um in another continent for your in your case you're coming from chile right yes i'm from chile um so um yeah and at the time when i was um myself a phd student where we're and there's also a phd network for the Max Planck and also in other research as associations. And we made a big effort to put together welcome packages for the international students, which not many receive or had received until then to make it easier for somebody. And even if you're a German in, in a new city, it's always difficult to find your way around with the authorities. But then to add another language is another <laughs> is another yeah. level of complexity. But um Maybe okay, so we talked about these things, but also um to start with, would you would you like well, would you please share a little bit about yourself, your background, why you made a decision to come to Germany of all the countries in the world <laughs> with our <laughs> weather <laughs> and <laughs> attitude as a German nation in our complex history? Well, dreadful. Um, to say the least. Um, but you're also very rich in culture, which I know you also appreciate. So, yeah, please tell us about yourself. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, well, I was born in Chile and I started my bachelor's studies in Chile in, in Valparaiso, um, culture and tourism management to be specific. And um, I really enjoyed my time in the university because I, I I got engaged in a lot of activities and I was working also as a um, student's um, tutor and after graduation also as a professor's assistant and everything was going great. <laughs> I, I was very happy with my professional development. I was working for the University of Valparaiso. I was working and La Sebastiana, which is Pablo Neruda's house in Valparaiso. He's a, a Nobel Prize in literature. So I, I was uh, very satisfied with my development. Um, but then, um, even though I was planning already to go abroad, because I, I from nature, I'm, I'm a very curious person. So I always had this uh, intention to go abroad. But I remember that time um, I wanted to apply for a scholarship or for a program, you know, working and studying. And I was thinking, oh, okay, maybe I can go to Australia or, you know, maybe I can go somewhere else. And uh, to be honest, I, I never thought I'm going to Germany. But mm -hmm. then I, I met uh, my husband <laughs> and that changed everything. I think, you know, that changed everything. It took me a while. It's not that I met him and, and I re, I decided, okay, I'm going mm -hmm. uh, to Germany. It took me like two years to take the decision. Uh, because like I said, I, I, I felt like really fulfilled in my personal and professional life in Chile. Uh, but you know, if I was thinking, okay, um, I feel this side of my life is complete. I feel great. 
But in my personal life, I, I wanted to have a family and I always wanted to, I think I always wanted to have a family, but I never expressed it like so openly, or maybe I never allowed myself to think, oh, maybe I can have a family, you know? But then I think when you met, when you meet the right person is, um, uh, is you're, I didn't even thought like this is going to be like, okay, I'm, I'm taking this decision like, I didn't know what I, the future would look like. I just did it. So I moved to Germany in 2010. And, and but I, I, you know, I, I, I told my husband, yeah, I'm going to Germany and it's going to be a real change because uh, in Chile I was busy and I was doing stuff. And in Germany, it's like, you know, you don't know anybody. Mm. And uh, you have to start from, from scratch. So you have to start for, from zero. And it was a it was a very shocking moment moment for me. It was very difficult. It was hard. But I, I told him, you know, I I I, um, I want to continue studying because this is where I feel happy. And and I applied for a master program. <clears throat> and uh, um, thankfully, I got a uh, six months later, or I think six or not nine months later, I got a, the place in the master program in international tourism management in Heide, in the um, uh, University of Applied Science, West Coast University in, in Heide. Mm -hmm. and, and so that helped me a lot to, to integrate myself in Germany and to feel like I'm part of a group again. Um, because like you said, uh, uh, for students, it's, it's a struggling time, it's difficult, but you know, it's also fun because you find other people who are in the same situation like you. I think it's more difficult when you move to Germany and you don't have a plan or you don't know what you are going to do. I think that's more difficult, this um, not knowing, you know, it's, that's, it's, I would say most, it's more difficult. And while doing my master's uh, studies, uh, I had the opportunity to do a, a semester ab uh, abroad. Mm -hmm. So I decided to, to go to Guangzhou in China. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Because you, know, awesome. <laughs> because, you know, I okay. thought, where is, the, where, is, because I thought, where is the place who is really, really far away? And maybe I will never have the chance to see again. Okay. So, yeah. so I decided. Yeah, well, I'm going to China. <laughs> no, it's in Where does it could go? <laughs> As, how was China? For, was it because I I've been to China for ten ten days or something with it or two weeks, and it blew my mind. Like what we hear in Sanji Rue about China is mostly oh they're copying this or oh, it's basically just bad news. Oh they're um, violating human rights. As if as Europeans wouldn't do that. Hello. Um, and I'm not trying to weigh one over the other, but I'm just saying pointing fingers is always easy. Um but then like the way like seeing people in their own habitats, <laughs> their own in their own nation. And then I I met a few locals also. It's funny, mm -hmm. I, I was on a train. So basically I was on a fellowship also, and we had a like a visit to Beijing and then also Sichuan, Chengdu, a city I'd never heard of, and I think they have more than 10 million people who live there. Yeah. I just was not on my radar. <laughs> and it's so beautiful as a city, and the food is so delicious. Like, I haven't eaten anything similarly delicious. Like, the Sichuan food is just for me. So, I was, I was like positively surprised is a heavy understatement. Yeah. Anyways, how was it for you? You know, I I, I remember my time in China like the best time ever, <laughs> maybe <laughs> before the, the my my children were born, of course. <laughs> but I would say, uh, um, I didn't know anything, you know, because okay, I, 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 maybe that's not one hundred percent right. But what I wanted to say is, um. I didn't know much about China. I know I, I knew maybe what we hear in the news and this idea that we have most also what you also referred to. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I didn't do any research because I had 
at, the at that time, I had this idea. I don't want to make any, any former ideas or prejudices. So I don't want to have this preconceived idea. I just want to go there and just to see how it is. Mm -hmm. And did, that works in, in one aspect more than the others. <laughs> that works in, in uh, because I didn't, uh, um, I, I'm not a judgmental person. I think in nature. So I think that helped me a lot to get integrated in different cultures, like, you know, in Germany or in China. It was so easy to make friends. Uh, it was unbelievable easy to make friends. And uh, because, you know, I think that the perspective that you have is going to help you a lot. I got there and I was just open to everybody. I was like, oh, hi, how are you? My name is Anna. Blah, blah, blah. I got along very well with my um, classmates and also with the, uh, how to say, with my, oh, oh, um, oh. I was living in a flatmate. Yeah. Yeah. With my flatmate because I, um, <laughs> and this is the other thing, it's full of surprises. I, I, I applied for a one person apartment, but I got two person apartment. So that was my first surprise. I was like, oh God, I have to live one entire semester with a person that I never him before mm -hmm. so I got there and we got along so well and we are still in touch and I'm talking about 10 years ago mm. you know and we lived five months together and she was just amazing she she's a girl from Russia we got along very well and we're still in contact mm. uh, so thank god you know I, I was lucky in that aspect and the other thing that I didn't lose any minute because, you know, I saw many were like, yeah, let's go party, you know, yeah, or, or, or yeah, uh, let's sleep most of the part of the day because it's so hot. And I was mm -hmm. in, a, in not, I, I was in summer when I get there, when I got there. Uh, but, you know, I was in Guangzhou, that is in South China, and it was very humid, very hot. And I remember the first, the first days, maybe the first two weeks, I couldn't really sleep at night because it was so hot and so humid. And, mm. and the mosquitoes was eating me oh. all over. And I, land, <laughs> you know, and I landed in the hospital like twice the first month. Uh, oh. First, because, you know, I was very ignorant. So I, I was like, you know, I think I eat like the Chinese, like I will eat, eat on the street. I will eat this and there. Oh, you had and, a mm -mm. Uh, tummy <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yes. So I thought you thought you can handle your your food. No, you can't. So, but you learn that way, and I think it's also that that's the fun part of life. You know, it's like I wasn't in in life because I'm I'm not that <laughs> uh, stupid. <laughs> you know, but I was thinking, okay, so it's yeah. And I got also in, in the hospital because of the mosquitoes, you know, I got like my legs was twice thick oh. and my arms were twice thick because I also got an infection. So right. I think in the beginning was most of getting used to this. Mm -hmm. But once you overcome that part, then it, it comes the really richness because I I met a lot of people really from China. I was in touch, of course, with internationals, but the richest part for me was to get in touch with locals and I went out and I I saw other cities and I tasted the food so I I had a great time and I never felt it, it this is a ve very weird feeling but I felt really safe in China mm -hmm. I have to say like I never felt before you know I actually I never felt that safety being that alone and it, mm -hmm. what what mm -hmm. caused you to feel safe you think compared to other places, what was it? Outside, uh, because you know, coming from, uh, I don't know how is it in other countries in Latin America, but growing up in Chile, I faced a lot of uncomfortable moments, especially the, the with men, you know, because the, now I think I, I change in a lot with the feminist movement and everything. And uh, there's more also governmental involvement in all these policies. Uh, uh, helping women and everything, but growing up, it was like you always had to be careful. You didn't know if somebody was going to touch you on the street, walking or in the bus, or you know, you have. I had to face a lot of these uncomfortable moments. Like there wasn't really 
it wasn't this feeling I'm safe all the time. And mm -hmm. I felt safe, of course, in, in Germany as well. Uh, I have much to say about Germany, but I had some uh, I had some experiences here that also were very uncomfortable. So, but in China, I never had that. Like you know, once I was uh, I was in a in a club in Germany. You know, we were dancing, and and a guy just pushed me. Mm. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe he was drunk, mm. but this really like it scares me. Yeah. Uh, so I think in this kind of aspect, like uh, I, I was alone on the on the on the subway on the street in in China, and I never felt like I'm danger. And was so, okay. but that's my experience. Yeah, yeah. That's my personal experience. I think I'm like so. I'm I'm wondering if it's cultural and I'm meaning ancient culture, or if it's because China is such a or known to be such a highly regulated state, where you know. I think because it's highly regulated. Oh. I mean, at the time, uh, um, I think it's also the people had this respect for authority because if a Chinese person steals from a Chinese person. <laughs> Everybody around will try to take this person and, and give it to the police. So people is defending themselves. And I saw once in the in the in the, in the train station, I saw that a guy tried to take a backpack for someone, and the people just get him, and they wouldn't let him go away. And I was like very impressed with this. And the guy who did this felt like really humiliated. So, mm -hmm. and then it came the police, and it was quite quiet for a episode like that mm. so um yeah so i don't uh, i didn't see much of like uh delinquency or, or situations like this mm. kind of situations mm -hmm. right okay <clears throat> okay um i remember also before i started my phd you know i was an international student myself in sweden and then france for three months so i knew what it can feel like and I think that's also why I was so sensitive to making it easy for the internationals now in Germany when I was doing my PhD. So compared to, I don't know if you're ready to make the jump yet. So feel free to also fill any gaps you, you want to fill. But um, compared to the experience you had in China, now coming to Germany, how is that different or similar? Um. <clears throat> Okay, but um, the, I think the experience in China was uh, 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 not so long. Um, it was only a semester, like five months. Um, so I, I don't want to compare mm -hmm. because I don't think it's uh, appropriate. I just, uh, I can jump to talk about my experience in Germany and without comparison. Um, uh, the experience that I have here in in the master program was uh, actually really good. Um, um, in the in uh, I I will jump maybe to the experience to the PhD now because I have this uh, I finished my master and then I have this uh, family time family period so I was I uh, I was like very long away from the university. Mm -hmm. And and now uh, I started um, at the, by the end of 2021. I started with the PhD program, and it's a uh, it's something that I wanted to do like a long time ago. Uh, I had it always in my mind uh, because I know that BDU had this program in heritage studies, and I knew that from a long time. <laughs> my plan actually was to finish, maybe finish the master and then go for the PhD. But then I realized, oh, if I want to make this family break, it has to be now. Uh, so yeah, um, so I had this time for myself, my family, and now in the PhD program, um, it's, I think it's challenging in some ways because my case is a very special case. I didn't, uh, I didn't flew from Chile just to do the PhD, so I'm living here for quite a while. So I think I got used to many, uh, many things in Germany. Um, uh, I think, like like you say in the beginning, is is quite difficult to make uh, like real friendships. 
-hmm. acquaintances, it happens all the time. But these real friendships, um, and I don't think it's only from the German side. I, I think it's also from my side because I, I, I feel that I need like a long time to really get someone uh, uh, trust to trust in someone you know I need like a lot this is a personal thing I because I see it in my neighbors you know with uh, um, I um, we moved from Hamburg to Rheinbeck so um, I see it in my neighbors that they, they never met before and then like the best friend <laughs> like three months ago uh, three months later I'm like the best friend and I, I can't do that <laughs> yeah but that's maybe it's uh, it's just, yeah, with some I, people we run in, so it just clicks and then it's just easy. Yeah. Whereas with others, maybe we are being triggered by past experiences, which absolutely, yeah. Awesome. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out, figure that out for myself also, because I think the older we get, the more picky we get about friends because we've already been hurt so many times and disappointed. It's um, true. It's true. But, yeah. You know, probably uh, maybe our subconscious is trying to protect us from from more disappointments to come, which also avoids or and thereby we miss chances of having happy moments before the disappointments come. <laughs> so the question is, what's the better deal? I don't know. Yeah, I think it also has to do with with ourselves growing as a person and learning from experience and learning also from ourselves because uh, also, you know sometimes uh, mm -hmm. oh, sorry i just wanted to add also, maybe also because the, the the extra energy that goes into you know figuring out yourself in a new country in a new city um in a new workplace and then there's only so much energy we have as humans mm -hmm. which we can either dedicate to administrative things or invest in building friendships. And you can try both, yeah. but it will not have the same yeah, opportunity, depending on how much mm -hmm. energy or how much research how many resources you have available that you now have to divide over. So now I'm I'm thinking analytical. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically our analytical mindset that we've tra become trained in as researchers. Or maybe by nature. But yeah, but keep going. I won't interrupt for the next couple of minutes. Yeah, no, no problem. So I, I think also we learn from ourselves, like performing in another country. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we are 100% ourselves. And I don't know what, in what, in which, in what degree or in what extent we want just to be agreeable and accepted. And, you know, so... I think that happens, maybe, or, or that happened to me, maybe that's just my experience, I don't know. But um, when I started to work in Germany, for example, I, I realized uh, that I will put a lot of efforts to, and people to like me, you know, or people to accept me because I didn't want to be like left aside or something. And, and I realized that that wasn't maybe so right because I was sure that I can do the job, but most of the time I would be doubting, like, I don't know if that has something to do that I come from Chile and in Chile it's like, maybe we are not considered first world country. So we will look at the global North countries like, oh my God, they are doing everything so right. You know, like they are so advanced and they have everything done and uh, they create so, so many things. So when I got here, I was with this kind of thinking. So I don't think that was appropriate and I shouldn't have uh, doubt of my capacities because mm -hmm. that, that really make me insecure and at the, uh, you know looking from some years apart I realized yeah that was only part of my insecurities because I thought I'm not at the same level uh, but I, actually I was and but you know that's uh, that's what I, I, I said before I learned about uh, a lot from myself in those uh, experiences. So now I think I have another way to face those challenges. Well, that's interesting. And, and I wonder, like, I mean, like, where do you think you were given that information and how? And it was probably subtle. When you were still work, um, studying and working in Chile, how did this image... How was that image presented to you 
that you then manifested in your mind that the global north countries are further ahead well probably technology wise but not with the research i mean capacity only when it comes to stuff but that the research approaches and research workflows would be equally valuable in like now that you've seen an experience but what made you think otherwise so I'm trying to figure that out because that's one of the main topics that I'm trying to tackle also with access to perspectives. So now South Divide, um, and working a lot with African researchers and African research environment, there there is often this expectations. Oh, um, the Europeans bring the money, so they dictate what the, how the research project is being um, planned and executed. Probably they also have more experience in the planning and execution of, of a big research project, some sort of international collaboration. But how can we, yeah, I mean, the, I'm, I'm asking myself where, where can we tap into changing mindsets on either end mm -hmm. or Northern um, of a European or North American researchers to acknowledge the local knowledge and the I mean, it also sounds uh, dividing, but the the knowledge and the and the the research practices that are established and very much valuable and equally mm -hmm. valuable in countries in Latin America or Europe, America and Africa and Asia. Um, so not to come with an assumption that everything is better in the West, mm -hmm. and on the other end, for well, researchers in Latin America and Africa and Asia to be self-aware and self-conscious and um, also stand their own ground for how they do research and that it's equally important and not minor as compared to yeah, yeah. I mean we, um, we probably yeah. I don't know like, I just want to we probably won't solve the issue today, but maybe if we can just try and analyze and what we've experienced, each of us. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it has many answers. It's not one answer, it's not one aspect, it's a lot of aspects surrounding this topic. Is I think it's, it, uh, it's uh, the way that the, the education system works, uh, the way that the influence the media had, have um yeah i think the uh, there are many answers you know like mm -hmm. the strugglings that we have in latin america maybe quite different the struggles that they in europe i mean living now in germany for quite a long now i mean more than 10 years i see also the problems here and i see the struggles here and yeah so um i really don't have an answer to that question i think it's, there has a lot of levels of complexity and and fixing. Um, but I, I would say that a good thing that we have is that globalization is helping a lot in terms of the researchers from the global south or you know from more uh, less developed countries can come to uh, more developed countries and then they can realize Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what? We also have this body of knowledge. We also have these uh, epistemologies that work for us, for mm -hmm. our reality. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have to impose like the way that you do things in developed countries, in developing countries, because they, they won't work. And I think that happened a lot. That happens a lot. Happened a lot in the past. Uh, that um, you will have these experts from uh, you know from everywhere trying to tell us how to do things <laughs> or how to solve our problems and that that is what i like about research and especially about qualitative research because you have the opportunity to integrate everybody in the discussion mm -hmm. you have the possibility to uh, to integrate local communities or cities or whatever and people is um, uh, have this uh, availability of resources to solve their own problems. So I really like that from participatory uh, methods, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really like the, this idea that everybody can be an expert where they live 
and where they and where they surroundings are. So I, I think that it, this is a good aspect of globalization that has helped us to get to know each other, to have a, a closer look to each other, and to understand that um, we don't need this. Uh, uh, okay, we don't need in in that totally this uh, expert uh, expertise from the global north or in all the subjects. Uh, we can also rely in our own uh, body of knowledge. So uh, I think that's a good thing. And I see it also in, in the PhD program and I see it also in, in, in conferences where it's, it's getting so intercultural and it's getting so international and I really like that. It's, uh, I think it's, it's the way that we can enrich uh, research and yeah, so. Yeah. I think also language. So thanks for sharing that. And I think well, we I think I know for a fact that we know both of us know how important language is. And mm -hmm. when I hear global north, global south, we spoke about this, was it just two days ago? Um mm -hmm. might carry information that is also historically loaded by assumptions that or when we talk about more or less developed countries, can we specify that we mean technology and nothing else? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if we have to use the term developed or underdeveloped or whatever, it's also relative and it's very sub mm -hmm. subject specific or centric, Eurocentric, mm -hmm. Northern Western centric, whatever, mm -hmm. because I mean, where has technology brought us really? Now we we are able to blow the whole planet into pieces, <laughs> great. Mm -hmm. And we know that technology is very, very much, um, is, is basically depriving us of our livelihoods on, on this planet. So is it really a win with all the comfort and the comfort is only for the few um, to make that comfort for the few happening? 80% of the population on this planet suffers as a consequence or as a starting point. Like to me, that's not an achievement, really. It's a it's a status, maybe, but nothing we should any anyone should continue aiming for. So I think also with research now and open science, now we have an opportunity, and also thanks to globalization, like you said, to shuffle the cards anew and give everybody a new deck of cards to yeah to change the game and the paradigms and to yes. develop into a way together and inclusively where everybody like every researcher from any part of the world can can contribute their aces like their best achievements and their best knowledge or most whatever that means now but the most sophisticated and well explored um, and with that, I also mean indigenous knowledge, because that's something that I'm also personally interested in, also professionally, and um, thankfully I'm not only one, and there's no institu institutions like the UNESCO who call for including indigenous and traditional knowledge systems into the solution finding for the global challenges that we have. And then I just wanted to also, like what we said on Tuesday in our conversation, to prepare for this meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when I, um, like, like how easily it slips our tongue, like when I was asking you what, oh, I was referring to Americans, meaning you as Americans, and then I was asking you, all of a sudden it hit me like, but you're American, what am I talking about? You're from Chile, and that's very <laughs> much America, as we know, like the territory, geographically. Yeah. so how is it? And then I was asking you, how upsetting is that really for you? <laughs> Do you want to go into that just with a few sentences again? Uh, or what's your strategy now that you? I, I used to be used to used to be upsetting, but I don't. I think mm, not so much anymore because uh, mm, um, it it has been so accepted worldwide that they call Americans to US citizens. Um, I mean, it's everywhere. It's in the news. It's the way that uh, countries refer to you to the United States, um, the way it's portrayed in movies. Um, so 
I think like they quite enough accepted this. They just took over the continent, like, yeah, it's America. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, when I face this, um, I just try to to engage in the conversation, say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm American too. Oh yeah, really? From where? I'm from the South. Oh yeah, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Mexico, South California. Oh, no, 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 more Southern, Southern than that. Oh, really? Southern than that, but can that be? Oh, I'm from Chile. And they're like, you know, a little bit shocked. <laughs> like, hey? No, of course. That's not and in America. It, yes, it is. Chile's in America. <laughs> it's in South America, but America is a continent. You know, this is, mm. so I think that as long as you know how to deal with that and, and you know, and, and uh, because, uh, when I when I read this in the paper or when I saw this in television and a really renowned uh, uh, television shows or programs or uh, I would say oh I'm going to write a letter because you know it's not appropriate that they say this is uh, in in America it's like that that is just too broad that you cannot say even inside in the of the United States you cannot say in America it's like this because it's so big is so different from state to state that it, I don't think it's appropriate to call uh, United States America. <laughs> yeah. But it's like I said in the beginning, it's, it's worldwide like mm. they, they just accepted that it's this, this, this way. So yeah. It's yeah, funny <laughs> how economic power seems to grow in our minds with with the extra size or how much a country or nation occupies in our in mm -hmm. our view because we have these discussions with it's like in with African mm -hmm. researchers or research mm -hmm. projects or anything um so with with Africa and Af and international research projects even if the 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 project is with one or two countries and then it's it's Germany and Africa even if we're just working with one country or maybe two. Can you not name the country? Because if you look at the size, Europe alone is tiny. And yet yes. they they compare or they put the whole continent with all its diversity, yes. charges as nations, economical situations, um, research capacities, which are highly diverse for us. And there's like and and anyways. And there's also a, an organization called Africa is a Country, um, where the answer would be, hey, can I remind you of it's actually not a, not a country, it's a, it's a continent, and we're talking 54 countries and then other states as well. Uh, just to call to the attention that what we're doing with our language. But that organization, Africa is a Country, is basically a political organization calling out on the Western view we have on Africa and its citizens and its political schemas, which is like often just good, like what we have of China. Um, yeah, I want okay. So politics, <laughs> but coming back. To, no, coming back no to, but, uh, you know, I think it's, a, it's an excellent point, the one you are doing, because it's a way in which how we use language yeah. to represent. Uh, realities so we have to be careful and that's why i like research uh because awesome research i have research. to stop you right there because awesome research <laughs> we do all the time and medical research like not being specific what is the research oh, yeah. on where was it conducted what are the mm -hmm. the samples who was interviewed for qualitative research what's the representation of a global um society if anything if it's only germans which Germans? Germany is also a highly diverse country, culture-wise. Yes. Are you are you measuring women against men? What about all the other genders in between? Or maybe not in between, but... So I think it's on researchers in particular to take charge of being aware. And that's where the knowledge is or should be in the first place, if nowhere else, when it should and must be and actually is at least accessible in academia. So why, I think we can do better from what we yes. see published. Sorry, but yeah, go ahead. I totally agree. I totally agree. It should be, you know, like good research. 
good research. It should be very specific. And I uh, I was discussing with that the other day with uh, also with my classmates like we cannot say we we should be very careful when in, in generalizing. You know we shouldn't be say uh, it's like uh, before I told you like you cannot even say this happening in America because what we know about America we hear a lot of from Los Angeles from New York you know from the big city from Washington but what happened with the other parts mm. of the United States not from America because you know what happened is in Canada or, you America, know yes, like and so we oh exactly when when or when we hear uh, references about Asia when they say in, in some part of Asia okay in which part of Asia can I just say, coming back to the United States, I just learned yesterday, apparently for the US Americans, there's a term from where they live and grew up, it's called flyover states. They don't even give themselves names anymore because it's just a state where you tend to fly over if you, as you travel from east to west coast, as if they don't exist. Like, what? <laughs> so <sad. laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, and yeah. we can find differences everywhere, you know? And, uh, if we go deeper and deeper, we, uh, especially in my field of study, you know, in heritage studies, we, uh, I, I read a lot about when people speak about communities, communities, even communities are heterogeneous in nature. It doesn't mean that if you have a community, even if it's a small one, mm. you, you won't find the same uh, meanings or the same uh, thinking in everybody. It's going to be diverse because that's our nature. We are diverse, even in the same. I cannot say, I told you, the, I, 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 I've been telling you a lot about this. I, I don't think I represent all Chileans. It's not possible. I don't think I represent all uh, researchers, for, uh, foreign researchers researching in Germany. I don't. We, you know, we can give some perspective because this is a lot uh, related to who we are, what is our background, what is our stories, what is our genetics. We carry with us all this knowledge and this is the way that we construct our realities. So I think that should be portrayed also in the way we talk, in the way we discuss, but we are living in a, in a, in a time in our society that everything is so rushed. You know, everything is so in the now and you have like news uh, every hour. It's just, it's just, there's no time to editing. There's no time to slow down and to think about this. So people just, you know, I, I, even myself, I'm listening to the news and I'm like alarmed <laughs> because, no. you know, two hours later it's worse, like three, better not to listen, better not to read mm -hmm. because at the end is you're going to be so overwhelmed with all this information that, like you said, most of the time is just um, it's misinformation. It's not well informed. It's not we hear any Asia is happening in this, any Latin America is happening in this. Okay, it's so big. You could you be more specific? Could mm. you specify? Because then That's everybody is so point. afraid to travel there. <laughs> it's not the same. Mm. You know, every country is different. Every reality is different, and. It is so complex. We should really avoid, avoid generalization. Mm -hmm. There's also, we have the same um, challenge in research with the publication pressure. And there's actually a term now for slow science, meaning allowing research again to be slow because good research does take a whole lot of time. But a PhD student tends to only have three years and hardly any. PhD student I met, including myself, manages to finish within three years because it's just crazy. And then you also have to publish two or three papers within the time. Like it's just what? Unless some other PhD student has has led the groundwork for you and you can just put the pieces together. In in the time we have as a PhD researcher, so yeah. three years is is also like very, it's very short. It's very tight. In in yeah. But so yeah. from, from a from a meta perspective, like because I'm also working on the kind of research management side of things, and things are changing to the better. So like we we're trying to figure out how can we assess research um, with quality measures, and that's hard to define for all the disciplines, all the research projects and topics. 
Um, so unfortunately, we don't have like the quantitative is an easy measure, like how many papers have you published in what journal. It's just not helpful. It's a it's a sickening system, and it's brought us to not a good place, which causes a lot of mental issues also in the researchers. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's just too much pressure and it's nonsense pressure on top. And we want to do valuable and meaningful research, but then we're being pressured to publish yes. just through the numbers, and that doesn't make sense. Um, so for the research culture, did you see differences? Or are you still in touch with your colleagues or... Um, with researchers in Chile to see how the research culture works in Chile versus um, Germany, knowing that the pressure is also on there, but maybe there's still some, I don't know. I wouldn't say we've lost all the good research culture aspects in Germany, but it's hard to maintain. Um, from, or even from what you've seen in mm -hmm. China like all the different places. Because what I've seen in Sweden is that also with regards to managing work-life work balance kind of thing, the Swedes are so different from how mm -hmm. they treat their staff generally, but also in a research mm -hmm. um, environment where people come between nine and 10 to the lab where, where I was working, then they have a one hour lunch break, then there's a three o'clock coffee break, and then they leave at five because they're picking their kids from 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 the kindergarten and, and school and whatnot. So Sweden apparently managed it's not perfect either, but it manages to at least give some ease of mind to and be family friendly more than like way more than Germany is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um I tend to say they also have fewer people to worry about. Because Germany has a whole lot of other issues to to deal mm -hmm. with. The education system is certainly not the first priority, unfortunately, and we yeah, that has consequences. But okay, but you're what's your <laughs> um yeah I, okay I remember uh, when I was working in Chile back in they they were more room for but I don't want to generalize. This was my experience. I just have to <laughs> highlight that. Um, we had a lot of uh, room for creativity. And um, so, and for in, so we, we could ex experiment, I would say. So for example, my personal experience was uh, because uh, I was working in the, uh, in culture and tourism management. So, we really had the opportunity to get in touch with local companies and and I could take the students to these companies to analyze how they work. So they were like a, like a, um, uh, how to say, uh, they were working together. So the, the companies would show students how they work and the students would analyze them. So it was like this, um, they were, we were helping each other, you know, this uh, cooperation kind of working and I also in the university so I think it, at that time in this specific case there were a lot of room for uh, improvement and creativity and to experiment like how can we create a better um, work educational environment because it was management so it, it, this concept of learning by doing was a lot of uh, in most of the discussion in terms of education, so there was this integration. And um, in terms of research, it was also intense. Uh, yeah, in terms of writing and to keep publishing, but I don't think at that time was so uh, pushed and stressful like in here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think this, uh, even though the work um, how to say the, the work structure in Chile is also like work, 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 work. Uh, but we will have like a nice um, pause in the middle to lunch break, you know, and we will have some time and we will have at least one hour because, you know, we want to just chill a little bit, to relax a little bit and then just come back. But the, even the working hours in Chile are insane. I, I mean, they are really long. Um, because also the structure, 
uh, the social structure at that time, I don't know how it's now, will help you, you know, like mothers will have the help from the families. So there's a more like if, uh, in that concept, it's not that maybe you will have your children in, in, in the, uh, kindergarten, you know, in baby care, but you will have your support from your family. You will have maybe your mom or your, uh, you know, your sister or someone in your family that will help you. Mm -hmm. Here in Germany, my experience is that you are most on your own if you have families. So I think the okay, the first thing for a for a working mom, the this environment they work is very hard. Even though you can work like a part time, like twenty hours per week, twenty five hours per week, but um, I still think that uh, you will be judged for how much you do in the work. Like, of course, the person who is there full time and every day and and doesn't have to leave because, you know, you have to pick up your share from, from school or you have a sick share, uh, child. I think I still think that we have this more like traditional way of see or perception of work, like someone who's there, like most of the time will be promoted and will be, you know, supported. And I mean, I mean that is what I've seen. So, um, and, and like you said, uh, I think Germany really has room to improve in terms of education and in terms of families. Like we should be the core of society. But what I see, this is my opinion, um, in Germany is very individual concentrated, like what is the best for the individual um, living more than for a family uh, perspective. And, and that makes difficult also for, in my case, I'm, uh, you know, I, I am a mother and I'm trying to be a researcher and I, you know, you have to work with the time you have and you can do, you, you are trying your best, but the time is always there, you know, like you have these time constraints and, and you miss also some opportunities because you cannot, unfortunately, if you're doing your PhD and then you want to work, how should how you should do it if you have only three years to do your PhD and, and then to have a job and then to have a family? It's just it's almost impossible. One of those three things are going to less in production and are going to be uh, left aside because it's just not possible. And um, yeah, so and. Uh, I, I see it even for my classmates that don't have families, they're also struggling, you know, because they have to have a job if they don't have funding for the projects. They have to work and they have to do the PhD and they're always divided between these two responsibilities. And even though you think, oh my God, I, it's the whole week, I haven't written new pages or, you know, I have to read this very interesting book and you wouldn't uh, have the time because you also have to, do your job in order to get the money to pay for your living in Germany. So I think there are a lot of topics around the difficulties or, or, yeah, or constraints that you will face, uh, not only as a foreigner, I think for working moms in German, I mean, German moms, that uh, is also like this. When, when, I, when they ask me, you know, what do you do? Oh, I'm doing my PhD. And like, what? A mom is doing that? How you do it? It's like, <laughs> it's like you're an alien because <laughs> you're a mom and you're trying to do something that is difficult, even for someone that has all the time to do this. So, um, yeah, I, um, I think in general is, and, and the push that you mentioned with the publishing in China was also this way, like they were very productive, like writing, writing like crazy and sleeping in the, in the, in the library. I just saw people sleeping during class, so. Yeah. They are really pushed. Wow. Yeah, it's not it's not a healthy uh, environment. I would say it's not a healthy thing to do. But it's with the with the rhythm. We really need this slow, or maybe to go a little bit back to the slow um, work, or maybe this perspective. It doesn't have to be so rush or so competitive. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I feel it's also a question of time management, but the time management responsibility should not only be with the individual researcher, but also the institution needs to have an awareness that people have families and 
and those that don't have a family of their own, they also have relatives and usually parents they need eventually to take care of. Um, also friends, they like friendships they have for their own well-being, they have to spend time on um, to nurture. And holidays, <laughs> I need holidays like for sure. So I think a workplace and very much so also academia needs to make provide room and also remind their staff and their their people to to take charge of also their personal lives, not only their professional lives. Because like mm -hmm. reminding us as the individuals of oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. you just need to manage your time better. But with all the pressure coming from the institution, how? Mm -hmm. Like, that's humanly impossible in some yeah. many circumstances. Mm -hmm. Did you did you ever feel you had to decide? I think I heard something like that earlier when you spoke. Did you think, did you, did you feel you had to decide between family, like having a family, having kids, or your academic career? Or was it always clear to you, you will find a way forward to manage both? Um, I, I definitely, when I went to have uh, children, I had to decide. Um, because um, at that time, my German wasn't that good. So my working possibilities were quite limited to international jobs. and. Even though I, I, I work between uh, my two children were born with it, between that time. But before that, I finished the master program and then I, I, I told my husband, okay, now we should try to have a, a baby because I wanted to really have the time for that. And I think that's also, it's a privilege. I mean, let's be honest, in, in our time, if you want to have a baby, most of them, you will continue working because you know you have to save money for your retirement and and in general this is a big deal because you really have to think in your future and oh my god when you're retire you uh, your retirement uh would you be able to pay the rent would you be able to live well and so this is a like very concerns in in germany so i think for me it was like i'm not going to look for a job because i know that i can't deal with the stress so, and I really want to uh, take the time and that was a privilege. So I, I had the time to have my baby and I was with my daughter at home for at least one and a half year. And then I contacted was one of my professors in the, in the university where I did the master and I wrote him and I was like, you know, uh, I'm just looking for an internship or for an opportunity. If you can give me a job when I can work 20 hours, I will be really grateful and, and happy to do it. And, and he said, of course, I, I would offer you possibilities. So I, I started the internship and then he hired me. So I worked there because I have this contact. But um, it, it's very dependent on what your circumstances are. So I think in that case, I had this luck that I knew someone who put me in a position, you know, who put me in a company. And you can, I think you always need these uh, connections and this network. Because if you do it on your own, um, you don't know how it's going to be and you cannot decide. Uh, so I think it was like that I, I, I had this contact and I, I worked was... for, for this company for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, I don't think you were lucky, you were proactive. So you were taking charge of the opportunities that you saw lying in front of you. And I was very hesitant for many opportunities that I saw because I always felt like, oh, I'm not good enough or this is not for me or I don't know. But just go for it and also to be proactive to to openly ask somebody or reach out hey i enjoyed the working with you and um, now i'm in a position to take up work again after um i spent you know after time off for for the children um do you see any possibilities proactive and that's usually rewarded by the universe or just by physical or metaphysical laws like you as you take action not everything might be replied positively, but there's always other opportunities that are coming your way as you move forward. Mm -hmm. So instead of sitting there and, and hoping for 
something coming our way mm -hmm. with which would be easy sitting in our comfort zone but it actually matters to reach out like you did and then mm -hmm. that's when opportunities arise so i wouldn't call it being lucky necessarily of course that the circumstances need also be right that the person you're reaching out to has the capacity to mm -hmm. provide you space and money eventually to work for them but if not one, then probably the other will have that. Yeah, you know, now that you that you mentioned it, it's you you just it hit me because it's true. You know, I think it has a lot to do with my background because I um, I wasn't supposed to go to university because my parents couldn't afford it, so I, I just started to work at a very young age because I realized like very young, oh my god, I'm poor, so I have to do something. To go to university so i had to, i started to work like a very young age to pay for my education so i think that has been like the way i confront life you know it's i have to do something to to reach my goal i have to i have to be proactive and even though with the with the phd because you know after um, I had my daughter and around 2016, I said, oh, you know, I really want to apply for, uh, for the PhD. And I had my, um, I had my, uh, how to say, my proposal written and I wanted to apply and then I got pregnant with my second child. And I said, okay, forget it. For, because I can't do both. And I'm, uh, it's the same thing. I didn't want to have the stress. I wanted to concentrate on my child. What, you know, I really believe in this thing, one thing at a time. Because if you concentrate in many things, you wouldn't have the energy to pay attention to anything. So I want to concentrate in my child. So I have my second child and then, but you know, time is ticking and, and uh, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, maybe I'm too old. The gap is too big. I'm too away from, uh, I, I haven't published anything. Oh my God, I don't have the chance. And then I, I say, okay, I'm going. Hmm? That's what we hear. I also heard that, oh, to be successful in research, you have to stay <laughs> on, like, and like, even, yeah. like, within one year, you're out of the system. It's not true. People, like, researchers change topics, meaning they start from scratch in a new research field, you know, sometimes late in their careers, and they can still be successful because nobody can take away the experiences and also the logical capacities that we've built even from primary school, like it's not, it doesn't get lost if we take a year off doing something else and running a family or managing mm -hmm. a family is a lot of uh, mm -hmm. project management. So you can also apply those skills that you establish in coordinating, managing the household. It's very similar, if not mm -hmm. like more or less the same for the, for the workflow that as we experience or have to coordinate in research. Yeah, but you know what, Joe? We really need to find that information somewhere. So if you can write a book about it, that would be great. <laughs> because it's very difficult to find to find those experiences. We we are just surrounded by you know this successful story. I am so successful. I did this like in thirty days. You know, it's like oh my god, it's, we're just bombarded with these successful stories. We really need more struggling stories. You know, or like um, how somebody started from scratch. We really need those stories because we always believe, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm, everybody's doing everything and I'm here and I'm, you know, oh, what is going to happen? And you're absolutely right. It's, uh, um, you know, after after my, my second show, I said, okay, it's, the possibility is over uh, because the gap is too big. Away, I was way too many years away, away from academia, so I'm going to get a job. And I really, I got a good work uh, at a private institution, uh, but I wanted to stay in education, you know. So I got in a private institution and I was working there. Um, also, I was in touch with professors and with students, and it was a great experience. And <laughs> it's funny that you that, that I mentioned this, but you know, I remember I went to the Chilean consulate because I, I, I had to do something like, a, a, yeah, I need a certificate or something. And I explained that, I, I'm, they asked me, you know, what are you doing? And I explained, oh, you know, I got this job and I'm doing this and that. And they were like, oh, but you know, that's a great job. You know? 
it's like <laughs> i would say yes of course it is but um you know because normally latin americans are not uh, they won't see you like oh my god and he got like a really management position it's like they spend you to this like uh, other kind of jobs like um, uh, lower position and, and so on so i was thinking oh, mm, okay uh, that's also this kind of thinking that we cannot do more uh, i don't like that uh, but anyway, that's just a parenthesis, you know. What I what I really want to, to tell you is like I was doing this job and then Corona came and uh, I was uh, losing my position because you know first in first out, and um, so um, what I what I knew okay they offered me to stay, but when I was working there I was always thinking why I'm not trying to do research again, because that's my passion. That is what I want to do. I feel so comfortable. And I have also this intellectual need. Uh, I know it's in myself and I was struggling because I was suffering, uh, even though the work was great and my colleagues were amazing. I had an amazing uh, experience there. It was great. Uh, but inside me, I was like, why I'm not writing anything? Why I'm not creating something new? So what I, when I knew I'm going to lose my job because it's Corona and you know a lot of people lost their position as well. So I contacted the university. So I wrote the university and I got an appointment with the coordinator. And the first thing I asked was like, tell me the truth. Do I have a chance? I, is, is the gap too big? Am I too old? Uh, is it possible to research with family? And I'm a foreigner, but I'm a German, but... <laughs> You know, I'm a German on the paper, but I was born in Chile. So all this, you know, the mi mixture of uh, experiences. And, and she was like, of course you can. But who told you you cannot do it? Of course you can. Just send your proposal. We will see. And even though this process took a lot of time, because it took me time to come back. It took me time to, to, to write the proposal and to, yeah, to to get familiarized again with the research process and with methodologies and with the uh, school of knowledge. So at the end it worked and I feel very fulfilled. So yeah, I'm happy that I I, I acted proactive again. <laughs> yeah, that. being rewarded, like, uh, yeah. taking charge of our lives. And also, like you said, like feeling, even though we're being told we have a good position and we cannot appreciate it, but to be aware or become aware eventually of our purpose and our calling, like what you really enjoy doing is uh, everyday practice, how to, how you want to work, knowing that academia can only provide for that, but why is there maybe other organizations outside academia that can provide a similar work ethics? And that's shifting all over society sectors, but so we can also design a workplace for us mm -hmm. and find the best possible fit. But I agree, like academia is a unique place mm -hmm. to be in. It's very elitist, it's not necessarily monetary wise, but it's also not meant, I mean, I don't know, not saying that it's only for the chosen few, but it's, it requires a dedication, a personal dedication to, to be willing. But yeah, so what is okay? So maybe concluding, as we've touched on the various aspects, challenges, opportunities in academia, besides academia, balancing work life. Um, if you and I try to make a short list of the usual challenges, and then you say you wanted to share also how you're tackling those and finding inner peace for yourself despite or with the challenges. Also a challenge-free world would be really boring. It's just a matter of how we approach them and learning resilience or being resilient mm -hmm. about them. And I think it's also a matter of personal responsibility as a word or a term that I only recently embodied for myself. Like we are personally responsible to how about how we feel in our lives and then we can also make informed decisions how we want to change certain things or what we can also expect from a workplace and the managing people in the workplace. We don't have to take any distasteful piece of meat or 
coverage that's being handed over. I don't know, I'm making funny images now. But but it's like I think it's also a matter of personal responsibility in, in the sense of knowing what we want and what we enjoy doing and what we are ready to deal with to a certain extent and where do we draw a line mm -hmm. well that's still manageable and that's too much to handle so i'm leaving academia or i'm leaving this group or i'm focusing more time on family because that's what i need for my own well-being mm -hmm. so how do you how what's your current approach not saying that it's the final like I think we are all constantly adapting. So I'm trying to say, but what is the your final or your current the final the final strategy will only be final when we leave this lifetime. <laughs> so what's the current strategy that you found for yourself to deal with the challenges that you've seen? Um, I think the first thing is that you uh, you have to see yourself. Inner, uh, in your inner, so uh, inside yourself, like you have to really know who you are, who, what is uh, has been your path, um, what was your background, was you have achieved, um, what has you have you overcome, what difficulties have you overcome, and um, so you really have to be aware of what has been your your way till now. And um, um, on that part, you know, like, um, and I think it's also you have to love yourself <laughs> and to forgive yourself and, and to be kind to yourself, like to understand yourself and, and treat yourself like this inner child um, that is content constantly by, uh, with you. And this inner child was also doing all this along with you. So I think doing peace with yourself is the first step. Um, I think there's another thing that we have to consider, like what are the resources that you have? Because you know, I'm unfor I, I fortunate that my husband supports me, but imagine uh, single mothers or imagine people who are alone and don't have family and families or don't have support or don't have family or don't have a job. So it's very also dependent on the circumstances. Um, and the other thing that I, I, I think is very important is we have to get away from the constant, um, w w uh, this temporary satisfaction, like, if you want results, I want results now. I want results today. Now we have to postpone the reward. You know, we have to postpone the reward and to see what you're doing is, you know, I, I this is very short, but I, 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 watched, I watched yesterday and um, a psychologist and he was explaining about the difference between the pleasure and happiness. And he said, pleasure is temporary, but happiness can, uh, can be a lifetime with you. So the pleasureness gives you this dopamine, which is the constant reward. You know, I'm going to watch something or I'm going to eat something to make me happy now because I'm too anxious or I'm too, I'm too worried. Don't have too much excess of future. You know, to live in the present. Mm -hmm. Just one day at a time, one day at a time to live the now, where, uh, where, am, where am I, what I'm doing? And these are not my words. These are words from the psychologist I'm reading, you know? And to concentrate on that and to live one day at a time and to postpone the reward. You know what I'm doing now? It doesn't have to be rewarding tomorrow or next week or next month. Of course, in the case of the PhD, the reward will come later. So if you have that state of mind that is telling you everything you are doing now is going to have a proper uh, a, a purpose in the future, it's fine. It's just going to be fine. Just concentrate and put quality on what you are doing right now. Take care of yourself. Don't have too many expectations and think positively, like be happy with small things and, and don't compare to your, uh, others just compared to who you were a month ago a year ago 10 years ago and if you're happy with the development just continue doing what you're doing yeah. keep going 
I think they like I've also learned that concept recently in the business development course that I'm taking. And they talk about the day you plant a seed is not the day you harvest the fruit or eat the fruit even. So harvest comes before then. And that's very much true for research experiments and work workflows. Um yeah. and also yeah, oh we could go on forever. But what I want for that. Yeah, and then also when you say like looking at the rewards, can we not also well, can we also see reward ourselves for the accomplishments? Like, well, I like a, appreciating what we accomplish over a day and feeling satisfied that we've actually done the work and rewarding ourselves that day, that moment, mm -hmm. so that we have not only a feeling of accomplishment, but also allow ourselves and celebrating the the accomplishments. Yes. And and rewarding ourselves in the sense of also some time off, like okay, now I I I entitle myself to spend time with my family and friends, and that then gives me energy again for another day to plant yes. more seeds <laughs> and to eventually harvest and then eat the food. So I think that's also important yeah, to only live in the now and work in the now and then wait for some future to eat the fruits, but also eat some fruits that you can already buy in the market <laughs> in the meantime <laughs> yeah and the market yeah. being like any leisure activities you know going climbing mountain hiking just chatting with your best yeah it, it, and what you're mentioning it, it goes hand in hand with the importance of relationships because mm. you know I, I i listen from a coach this uh, from a spain coach i think it was a volleyball team i'm not sure but he said if you want to if you want to advance uh, rapidly you should go alone but if you want to advance to get like a really big uh, accomplishment you mm. should go together mm. so i think the importance of relationships are are, are huge yeah, what I, uh, what I mentioned before about the reward is like we live in a society who who expects everything to get now. Like you know, our parents used to used to work like thirty years and to buy a home, and we want to buy it now when we are thirty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I meant. Like you don't need to, you know, you don't have to have this uh, obligation that you have to do things. Uh, because everybody else is pushing themselves and is stressing them out and to do those things, but you can have your own approach to happiness. Mm. Your happiness can be to walk out with your dog or, you know, you you, you are the own um, owner of your happiness. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a perfect final um, statement because not so much coincidentally, but we have an episode that's already published on being a happy person by Sarah Hefty. She's a she, she's she's a friend colleague and a so she's she specialized out of her own life experience in dedicating herself to be happy, like deliberately. And happiness is work. Feeling happy in the moment is quite a bit of work, and it's so rewarding. So you can work towards being happy, not in 10 years from now but today and tomorrow and it takes effort but you'll feel happy and that's like the best feeling ever happy in the workplace happy with the family happy and it's it's be, i think it's being aware and dedicate like de dedicating time to mm. find energy to go and experience stuff to meet new friends new people to spend time with your family deliberately making making room in your calendar for your kids and that sounds very mechanic but it opens opportunities for connecting with the people that you love that we love and are also responsible for to make them happy and they can only be happy when we are happy and we are happy when we make time for happy moments and the happy moments can also be in the workplace by being appreciative of and purposeful also in the work you do like checking in with our value systems and knowing that we are actually enabled by the institution to work according to our personal ethical and value value standards. 
And there's a, quite a bit of contradiction there in the current system, but there's also still a lot of opportunities that have persisted over the years and over the pressure points. So, so yeah. Will you, so do, would you like to add something for, for that closing remark, you know, dialogue? Yeah. Just uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about these topics and yeah, maybe we can <laughs> have another episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's so much stuff. Like, so, it's have... so much fun to talk to you. So thank you, Joe. Oh, it's likewise, like I learn so much every time and like in the podcast generally and also with you in particular. So you're always like, you're welcome back anytime. And yeah, and we're as, like, I can, I think I can speak to on behalf of us, some of not many or all of the listeners where wish you all the best and hope to Thank have you. you in the show sometime soon hearing of your hearing about your accomplishments like how you continue to yeah to pave your your career and start building a meaningful or continue working a meaningful life what i can't make sense now of my words but i'm trying to say <laughs> i want to come back <laughs> and in touch. thank you everyone thank you joe bye bye